r slash no sleep posted by you slash alias for whom i saw my friends disappear at pan's cove i wish i went with them we were all around 14 so my parents forced my older brother to stay with us at the cottage we rented well rented is a bit much it was my friend josh's uncle's place and he asked for 20 bucks each and a promise we wouldn't touch his tequila not an issue for me i didn't understand how anyone could drink the stuff so as my dad's wood-sided station wagon disappeared into the brush, it was me, Josh, Linnea, Dan, and Jeff, my older brother, dragging our bags inside. We had three nights out there, alone and unsupervised, and brought along a slew of board games, sodas, and hot dogs and s'mores and horror stories for the fire. None of us had any experience with campfire building, but we couldn't imagine it was too hard. We were so young. The fire pit was dug out a few yards east of the cottage, toward the wide lake view. An outhouse stood on the south side of the cottage, and north were hiking trails that led deep into the woods, or curving around to the water. As only Josh had ever been there, and not in a few years, we'd set aside day one for exploration. I took the lead, the energetic wide-eyed kid I was. Right behind me was Joshua when we first met a couple years prior, Josh was a violent, aggressive youth. I remember him liking to throw me down the snowy hill, as if that were a game we were playing. But he'd cooled down since then, and that weekend, he was one of my closest friends, still a sarcastic ass sometimes, but more loyal and supportive of whatever you were excited about than anyone I knew. Behind us were Dan and Linnea. Linnea had recently started dabbling in Wicca, and when Linnea dabbled, she dabbled hard. She was explaining the meanings and uses of the various trees, their barks, their leaves that we were passing by, most of which to this day I think was fully inaccurate. But her spirit was open and her heart was in the right place. Dan was nodding along and asking questions. He was a studious little guy with thick glasses, and for a bit had seemed to be growing apart from our friend group. Josh's aggressive influence rubbed him the wrong way. But he'd lately changed his tune and stuck around, and was more excited than anyone about getting away from school and his job for the weekend away. Jeff trailed behind. At 18, he was way beyond whatever new liberties we were experiencing. Nowadays, he'd be ignoring us on his phone. Back then, and with our small town upbringing, he was playing with a butterfly knife to pass the time in the afternoon sun. We wandered along the trail, bedded with dried pine needles and weeds, and made our way down the steep hills toward the shoreline. It was no beach, that was for sure. Just a collection of large, jagged rocks that slanted and sunk into the cold murky water. We spread out to search for any good jumping in, or better yet swinging in spots. That's when I found the small cove. It was dry when I found it this circle of packed mud and the bones of river life. Josh said his uncle referred to this as Pan's Cove, though it probably didn't have an official name. It was nothing really notable, but he said that when the tide comes in, the stillest, most perfect water you'll ever see fills it in a perfect circle. We made a vow we'd see it for ourselves, before Jeff hollered at us that it was getting dark. If we were gonna build a fire, we should get on it soon. We could see Pan's Cove from near the fire pit, but getting there still required the long way as our vantage point was from atop a tall cliff. Still, we were happy we wouldn't have to trek all that way just to see if the tide had come in yet. That night, we ate hot dogs over what embers we could manage to get going, as well as some roasted corn on the cob. We played Settlers of Catan, sang some songs badly, and had a really fantastic time under the stars. To this day, it's one of my favorite memories. But things quickly changed from there. The next morning, Linnea was out on the front porch of the cottage before any of us had woken up. While Jeff got the gas stove hooked up, I went out to check on her. She said it was just hard to sleep out here with all the crickets and birds and hadn't managed to get much shut eye at all. But it was nothing to worry about, she was fine. And she did seem fine. A calm smile was plastered on her face, and she hugged her knees to her chest in a relaxed fetal position. But there was something dreamy in her eyes that I couldn't put my finger on. And it unsettled me. Still, the day continued on. Grey clouds were rolling in, which we knew was a risk for one of the days when we picked the weekend. So we stuck around inside and played cards and ate canned foods. Around 4 or so, Jeff found the tequila Josh's uncle had warned us away from. We thought it was some fancy vintage, something expensive, but this was not what he found. It was a giant keg stored in the back of the pantry, sloshing with gallons of tequila. Josh's uncle was a truck driver, and often delivered huge hauls of booze. Jeff opened up the nozzle and poured out a shot for himself, despite my protests. He threw it back, cringed hard, then coughed and laughed. 
Apparently, it was some filthy stuff. Like it had spilled into the bottom of the truck, and Josh's uncle had collected it. He offered me some, but I refused. I'd seen the horrible reaction my brother had to it, why should I try it? Jeff shrugged and moved on to Josh, who stared at the large keg in deliberation. I reminded him we promised his uncle we wouldn't, but he made the valid point that there was no way his uncle would notice anything being missing from this huge supply. Josh stepped forward and took a small shot from Jeff and drank it with a severe hiss of pain and pleasure. Jeff slapped his back and laughed. Dan and Lania took some as well. I could see the concern and fear in their eyes, but they pushed through anyway. I watched from the table, shuffling the cards, waiting for another game to start up. I was worried they were going to make themselves sick. That wasn't the kind of cottage weekend any of us were looking for. But eventually, they all came back to the kitchen table, a little wobbly, and we started up another hand just as the thunder began to rumble outside. As the night went on and the storm grew louder, we started trying to scare each other. It started with Josh disappearing for a chunk of time, only to leap out from the front closet when we went to check on him. He really fucking got me. It was humiliating how high I screamed. But we laughed it off, no damage. Then we all agreed to make up some scary true story about some murders that happened at this very cottage, to tell Dan when he got back from the outhouse. He didn't buy it, but I could tell our tale of horror was working on him. Honestly, it was working on all of us. When Linnea had to go upstairs to get her meds, she asked Dan to go with her cause it was so dark. Jeff was drinking in the corner, and Josh was gone again. So I went wandering through the cottage, ready and alert for whatever tricks he might have up his sleeve. Instead, I opened the door to his room and accidentally found him changing. I jumped and apologized profusely, but he laughed and said it was fine. He was standing there in his boxers, just talking like it was nothing. About what we were going to tomorrow, about that most recent game of slap he should have won. And Josh was only a few months older than me, but he was much more developed. He had semi-defined muscles, and some hair growing on his chest, and some just below his belly button. I told him I needed to grab some water, and asked if he wanted any too. He said he was fine, and he'd be out in a bit, so I went off. Ran off, more like. I wasn't sure why I needed to get away from him. Maybe I felt like he was going to be mad at me? I reached the kitchen again and got myself some water. My brother called out for me to pass him some chips, and I did on autopilot. I sat there as he reminisced about when he was our age and all the shit he got up to with his friends. But how he never saw those people anymore. Not since they graduated. But this was nice, being able to experience it second hand. He wished we could stay here even longer. I started to wonder what was taking Linnea and Dan so long, so I stood up and walked up the stairs to the landing and called for them. Nothing. I approached her room and knocked. I could hear sniffling from inside. Not wanting a repeat of Josh's room. I called out again. Just as I did, Linnea opened the door inches from my face and I stepped back. She looked at me with those dreamy eyes and contented smile, and I asked if everything was okay. She said everything was fine, asked if there were still Pringles left, and floated by and back downstairs. Dan was on the bed, wiping his eyes. He put his glasses back on and looked up at me. I didn't want to sound like a broken record of checking in, so I just said hey. He snickered, then for reasons I still don't understand. He asked me if I still watch Disney movies. I said no, and he nodded and muttered to himself that they're really good. He smiled to himself. I told him I'd meet him back downstairs and ventured away. It was dark in the living room. I could make out Jeff, asleep in his chair, but no one else. Had Linnea gone outside? I almost left, when I saw a form beside the table. It was crumpled down, kneeling, but one hand held the edge of the table for support. I squinted to try and make out who it was. My words caught in my throat at how out of the ordinary it looked. I could hear whispering. So slightly from that shadow, words were being spoken. I knelt to and finally could see it was Linnea. And she was whispering to Josh, who sat with his legs crossed and head slightly bowed underneath the table. I asked them what the hell they were doing, and said that it was too late in the night for more scary games. Neither reacted. Linnea just pulled away from Josh and sat on her feet. She looked into my eyes her own eyes just two blue reflected dots from the dim moonlight, and told me she was going to sleep now. A shiver ran up my spine and I rubbed the back of my neck. Once she was gone, I asked Josh what they were talking about down there. He didn't leave his spot, he just said from the shadows we were talking about going down to Pan's Cove. I shrugged, confused and exasperated. I said that sounded great, and that I was going to bed now too. Maybe they had drunk more than I thought. 
Josh didn't move an inch as I retreated out to my room and closed the door behind me. There was nothing to wake me up. No crickets, no birds, no thunder. The world had died down to a quiet pattering of rain and not another sound. So why had I found myself jolting up as if late for something important? My tired eyes took in the pitch black room and I listened for signs of life elsewhere in the cottage. Josh was a heavy snorer, and there were no sounds of that. And Linnea's bedroom was right above mine, and she tended to toss and turn, squeaking that rusted bed frame. But nothing. I found myself getting to my feet and shuffling out my door. My initial instinct was to search outside, but I wasn't sure why when Josh's room was right beside mine. I opened his door again, and cautiously peered through the crack. His bed was empty. I quietly called his name, then began to move to the other rooms. Jeff was still passed out in his chair, but every other room is bare and silent. Not a sign of my friends. I shook my brother, told him what was going on, but he just groaned and weakly waved me off. He was too messed up to move. So I grabbed a flashlight from near the door out to the fire pit and went out into the rain. It was a pleasant trickle, to feel, to hear, everything. The slight cool in the warm night would have been perfect in other situations. As I walked through the grass, I realized I hadn't put on any socks or shoes. The wet grass slid between my toes, tickling me and caressing me. It was so beautiful. I shook my head. I couldn't enjoy this. I couldn't relax when I had no idea if my friends were hurt, or in danger. Though they likely weren't. There was the outhouse, there was the attic. Why didn't I check those? Why was I walking so directly to the cliff overlooking the water? No, not the water. In the center of Pan's Cove, that tiny inlet, I saw three heads bobbing above the most still water I'd ever seen. Not a ripple emanated from their movement together, and they were moving, swaying, dipping, jumping, laughing. So carefree. So pure. The sounds of their joy echoed out and up to me and it was just as crystal clear and untouchable as that water. I wanted to laugh like that. And there was room. Room for me. And so I stepped. The blast of air in my face woke me from my stupor as I fell, but it was much too late. The rushing wind deafened me and I spun and tried to grab onto the cliff beside me to slow the fall. But nothing caught until the sickening crunch as I hit the rocks. The pain shot through my right leg and up into my pelvis as I writhed in silent anguish. I slapped the cold stone beneath me and tried to raise myself up, but only felt more pain, this time enough to let me scream. My knee was a mess of blood and pulp, and above it, thick bone stuck out, a wild wide in the moonlight. My foot was spun the wrong way around, no, both feet, pointing out like some sickening circus trick. I cried for my brother, for anyone, and rolled onto my back. I didn't know what I was supposed to do. I didn't know what was happening. Josh called my name. I rolled my head onto the side and saw them. All three, watching me from the water of that perfect circle, waiting. Josh's hair was matted down, and the water jumped up and down his bare neck to his chin and he was smiling. Such a simple smile. He was a kid. He was my friend. And he wanted to play in the water with me. One shaking hand inched forward, and I grabbed the edge of the stone and pulled myself towards my friends. Just four friends. All so happy. In water that didn't ripple. Not even from the sprinkling of the rain above. My other hand reached forward, and I saw that it too was disgustingly mangled, but I didn't stop. I kept crawling. Dan smiled, his face much more like a child without those glasses, which helped him read and learn and work in stress, but he didn't need them anymore. My exposed bone scratched against the rock as I dragged my body closer. I was so close. Lenia's eyes were all of our eyes, then. They reflected the moonlight in the second star to the right and straight on till morning, and it was perfect. My bone caught the edge of the stone and pulled and ripped another scream from me as everything went black. My brother apparently found me shortly afterward. He called the hospital and I was airlifted out and barely survived the amount of blood I lost. But the tide had gone out by the time anyone arrived. And Pan's Cove was empty.